We're here in chapter number one of the book of Romans. There's an interesting exchange here. I would never think that being unthankful would be a real horrible sin. But if you look at this scripture, you'll find out unthankfulness is almost, it would seem, the seed for numbers of horrible sins. Pride, worshiping the creature more than the creator, sexual sins, homosexuality. Would you look at it, please? Look at verse number 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were, notice the word, thankful. That means they were unthankful. But became vain in their imaginations, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made look like to corruptible man. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Neither were they thankful. We live in a generation where many people aren't thankful for anything they have at all. We as Christians, certainly if anybody should be thankful, you and I should be thankful should thank, be, be thankful, number one, that we're saved. Amen. It can't get much better than that. I don't care on your worst day, you could be thankful that you're saved. A lot of people have trouble in this world, and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We know that. But what sets us apart is we have a God that loves us, and we know it, and we have a Savior that died for us. I think sometimes we become so selfish, so unthankful that we can't even pray right. Did you know what prayer is? Actually, prayer is asking. John R. Rice used to have a famous sermon, prayer is asking. So when you're praying, you're asking for something. But I thought about this. Is there anywhere in the Bible that God asks us for something? In other words, is God praying for us to do something? Actually, there is. Anytime you have a commandment, God is asking us to do something, and you, can, you could more or less say that God is praying that we would answer his prayer. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mean, it goes over and over and over again. I think sometimes we need to realize that as we ask God for something, we get upset that God doesn't answer our prayers. And I don't know if you're that way or not, but God can say no. And I'm thankful that a God can say no and often does say no to protect us because he knows what's right. He knows what we need. And so many times we pray for our will. In fact, we should be praying for thy will be done, Lord. We should trust him for that. That would be a good thing. But people are unthankful. I heard the story, and I've, I've, I think I've told it before, of a young man that was graduating. He was all excited. He came from an affluent family. His dad was a doctor and had a lot of money. His dad would take him down to different car lots, and they'd look at the car lots at new cars. And he never said anything, but the son figured on his graduation day coming up, he figured that he would get a car from dad. And so on graduation day, his dad called him into his office, told him how proud he was, and he had a package for him. And so he gave that package, put it on the desk there in his study, and said, son, this is yours. I want you to take a look at it. And he began to unwrap the paper from the package. And when he started unwrapping the paper, he could see the word being spelled out. H O L Y B I B. That was all he needed. That young man got upset because he was thinking he was going to get a car. He took that Bible and tossed it through the room of that study and said, Dad, I cannot believe you would give me a Bible on my graduation day. And he stormed out, stormed not only out of the room, but he stormed out of the house, and he never talked to his dad again, never. 
years passed. One day mom called her son and she gave him the dreadful words that many of us probably have heard. Son, dad passed away this morning. You need to come home. He'd been gone for a number of years and that young man packed everything and on the trip home all he could think about was his last exchange with his dad. Can you imagine your last exchange being with your dad that you're so mad at dad that you throw a Bible across the room and you storm out of the, out of the house. Your dad's taken care of you and your mom and they've nurtured you and you're ungrateful and unthankful thinking that you were going to get a car. When he got home, he hugged his mom, of course, and he said, Mom, can I go into Dad's office? I just want to relive something that happened. And she knew what was going on. And that young man walked into that office. The desk was still there. Everything was in place. And when he looked over at the desk, he saw that wrapping paper with that Bible still partially wrapped. And he just looked at it for a little while. And then he grabbed it. And when he grabbed it, something fell from that Bible. Do you know what fell from that Bible? Car keys fell from that Bible. That boy reached down and picked up those car keys and he began to look at the Bible and thumb through that Bible and in the Bible was a card Here's what the card said. Son, congratulations on your graduation. Here's the key to your new car you picked out. This car will get you to where you are going and the Bible will keep you on the right road while you are traveling there. Love always, Dad. Oh, how his heart was pierced as he remembered back to those words and that exchange he had with his dad. And a rage of... Just anger, that boy, because of unthankfulness, did what he should not have ever conceived of doing. For the rest of his life, he would not only remember the fact that he had a car right there for him, but the fact that he said those words to his dad and they were the wrong words to say. You know what? We have become unthankful people. I still believe, even though America is going a different direction and we're looking at America going a different direction, even as we sit here tonight, I still believe America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. I believe that with all my heart. I am proud to be an American. I'm thankful in this room we have men that defend our freedom. I'm thankful that there's men that stand up and want to be a soldier. I'm honored to be a pastor of those men. But we become unthankful. We grumble, we complain, we complain about our circumstances. And if there's anything God's displeased with, it's a spirit of unthankfulness, a spirit of complaining. The children of Israel complained and God called them a stiff-necked people. Would to God that he would find a people, even this church, that would be a thankful people, would be thankful for everything that we have. Sometimes we need to realize what we have. And sometimes it takes kind of some bad circumstances to reveal what we have. Years ago, we were living out in Merrimack, and it was the wintertime, and a storm came through, and it was a pretty bad storm. Now, I like snow, but I don't like electricity going out while the snow is falling. And this storm came through, and boy, it knocked out the electricity, and for three days, my wife and I and my dog had no electricity and no heat. Now, there's good to that. We snuggle more. We put on more clothing. We sat around in the house, and we wore jackets. We got in the covers real good at night. There were a lot of things that changed during that time. But boy, you know, even though I realized it's so easy when things like that happen that you can become unthankful and you can complain. 
Why aren't they out here? I remember we went out on a Monday and it had been three days and we were saying, boy, maybe today is the day. And we came home from eating out. We walked into the place and I said, honey, just check the light switch. And she checked the light switch and guess what happened? Praise God. The lights came on. Amen. I'm thankful for the light bulb. I'm thankful for the greatest invention ever made to mankind called air conditioning, praise God. What a great invention. Whoever invented that, they should be, man, we should know their name from eternity to eternity. Sometimes we don't think of the little things. I'm thankful for cars that run. I'm thankful for the trash man that picks up the trash. I'm thankful for the people in this church that do the little things that never get any recognition. Nobody knows what you do, but God knows what you do. When everybody's gone home, maybe you're staying and you're putting things together in the, in the seats. Maybe you're taking a broom and you're sweeping the floor. Maybe you're taking a mop and you're mopping the floor. Just little things. We call them little things, but really they're not little things. They're big things. They're just as big as everything else that goes on the church. Everything about God's work is a big thing. We've got to get out of the idea. We've got to get out of the habit of calling things little things or big things. Boy, everything's a big thing. This is a big thing. The church of the living God is a big thing. Maybe sometimes God takes things away from us to teach us to be thankful. I'm thankful for a roof over my head. I live in a one-bedroom apartment. But it has all my needs. Has food in the cupboard. Has a nice bed in there. My dog's there. My wife is there. Actually, my wife is before my dog, so nobody criticizes me. There was a famous preacher one time that went to a restaurant and he was eating a meal and a, a man recognized him. And he came up to him and said, Preacher, can I, can I sit down and eat with you if you're having a meal? He said, Yes, sir, go right ahead. And that preacher, as was his custom, as should be our custom, he bowed his head and began to thank God for the food. You do thank God for the food, don't you? I had a Christian one time tell me, well, preacher, I, I don't do that in a restaurant. It's kind of embarrassing. Maybe it was embarrassing for the Lord Jesus Christ to die on a cross, hang there naked in shame. Maybe that was embarrassing. And we can't even lift up our voice in a restaurant and give God thanks. I had a family one time that heard me pray and came up to me afterwards and said, Sir, I just want you to know, thank you for doing that. I don't hear that anymore. Hey, you can be a testimony to other people by thanking God for the food. Somebody could say, well, I just whisper it. You should have known Carl Hatch. Carl Hatch is an evangelist. Went out to eat with him one time and I wasn't the preacher, thank God. <laughs> but the preacher was there and after the meal was over, he got up in the restaurant. He said, folks, I want to have your attention here right now, folks. Have you, I want to have your attention. You only need to know Carl Hatch. Anybody know the name Carl Hatch? Anybody know? Oh, you know who he is. I want to have your attention. He said, uh, we just had a wonderful meal and thank God for it. And I want you to know the preacher right now is going to tell all of you how to get to heaven right now. Listen up, please. Of course, the preacher couldn't believe that he put him on the spot then, and I'm just glad I wasn't a preacher then. Don't get any ideas. You won't be around very long. Take it for a threat all you want. I remember that happening. I told my assistant pastor, you should get scared at that. And I was out at Texas Baptist College one time at a conference, and we went out to, a, to eat at a... Uh, at a, uh, what's that, uh, uh, what's that Italian place, uh, Olive Garden. We went out to Olive Garden. 
and uh, my assistant could sing just like you. And so I looked at him, I said, Brother Dusty, I said, uh, you're getting all expenses paid to this conference. I think right now, if you want to keep your job, you'll stand up and sing in front of everybody. I was just kidding. And he stood up, and he started singing Amazing Grace. And I said, sit down, please. <laughs> and he continued to sing Amazing Grace. That's what I call loyalty. Amen? Not that I'll ever do that to you, but... So, doctor, this preacher, he prayed and asked God to thank, thank God for the food. The man that had come up to this preacher, he said, so you're one of those preachers, aren't you? He said, what do you mean? He said, you're one of those preachers that just want the limelight. He said, sir, all I was doing is I was thanking God for the food. He said, well, I don't need to thank God. Everything I earn, I earn by the sweat of my brow. I just dig in and enjoy the food. And the preacher looked at him and he said, so you're one of those people, aren't you? He said, what do you mean, preacher? He said, well, you're just like my dog, to be honest with you. My dog does that. And you know what? If we can't just even during the day thank God, bow our head and thank God for the food, boy, there's something wrong. God doesn't have to give us that food. You know how many people would love to just have a little bit of pizza when you have pizza? You know how many people across this world would love to have what you have tonight in the way of pie? Think about that. God's been good to us. And we can't even tell him, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Paul wrote, and everything give thanks. Everything. The psalmist wrote, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. God doesn't need our gratitude, but we need to give our gratitude. Happy people are people that are praising people, are thankful people. If you look at the people that are unhappy, I guarantee you there's a common denominator. They're unhappy because they're unthankful. They can't see the goodness of God in their life. God's a good God. He's always been a good God. He'll always continue to be a good God. He gives to us more than we deserve. Amen, He does. A little child that has nothing in life can be happy. A widow who's lost her husband can be happy. A grieving father can be happy. An unemployed worker can be happy. A failing student can be happy. How? Well, the failing student better see a... <laughs> they better go and see somebody to help them. How can you be happy? By giving thanks. In everything the Bible says, give thanks. Some years ago in New York City, and boy, doesn't New York City come out with a lot of stories. There was this woman. She was up on the 44th story of a building in New York City. The alarms went out. This lady was threatening to jump off the 44th floor. She was standing on the outside, on the ledge of the building, the police came and couldn't do anything. So one of the policemen had a pastor friend, and he called up his pastor and said, will you come and help? Maybe you can say something to this lady. So this man came, and he was afraid to get too close, because if he got too close, he was afraid that she would look at it as him coming after her. So he was very cautious in what he did. He inched close to her and said these words, Ma'am, he said, I am sorry you feel that no one loves you. Oh, she said, no one loves me. Let me tell you something. I have grandchildren. They love me. I have children, and they love me. My mom and dad, they love me. My whole family loves me. Well, the pastor took a step closer as she was spouting off how many people loved her. Then he said to this lady, he said, well, maybe you're just poor then. 
Is that why you want to take your life? The lady said, poor? Do I look like I'm poor? Look at the way I'm dressed, sir. We live in a nice house. In fact, we would say, live in a mansion. I'm not poor. And all the while, the pastor was getting a little closer. Then the pastor said, then why do you want to kill yourself, ma'am? And when he said that, the lady said, you know, sir, you're right. I'm loved, and I've got everything anybody would want. And she walked off that ledge as he grabbed her hand to avoid that suicide. The police came. They talked with her, and they let her go. And she walked off with that man. And as they walked off, you could see that lady open up her wallet in her purse and when she was showing the pictures of her grandchildren to that man. Oh, we need to be thankful. We've got so much, don't we? So much. We're prone to focus on the wrong things. We focus on the negatives instead of the positives. If I want to, I can focus on all the negatives in my life and I can be unhappy. But if I want to and I choose to, I can focus on the positives of my life and boy, that will give, give me great pleasure. God's a good God. Let me say it again. God is a good God. Now let me give us a few reminders for us before we indulge in that pie. Number one, thankful people do not complain. Thankful people do not complain. If you find yourself complaining, I would like for you to ask yourself, is there an absence of thankfulness in your life? Thankful people don't complain. Complainers are never thankful. There's nothing to be complaining about. When I was a young man, we were in school and we had to find a place to live. We had three children and everything around us, they required us to have a three-bedroom apartment. If you had a child, you had to have a one-bedroom. If you had two children, you had to have two bedrooms. If you had three children, you had to have three bedrooms. If you had four children, you had to have four children. And so we kind of priced ourselves out of the marketplace. We ended up buying a trailer. I won't go into that, but that wasn't of God. We bought this trailer out in Cedar Lake. You'll know where Cedar Lake is. It was a 45-minute ride from the church. There's other couples there that were from the college, but we were out in the woods. Now, I'm 22, 23 years old, and I don't like critters. I don't like little bugs. I don't like big bugs either. I don't like roaches. I don't like ants, and I especially don't like the chocolate-covered ants, if you know what I mean. And we came home one night, my wife will remember this, and our little trailer, I think it was 14 by 70 maybe, three-bedroom, it was covered in ants. I mean to tell you, you could not walk without stepping on ants. There were ants to my right and ants to my left. I could make a song for this. Ants to my right, ants to my left, ants in front, ants. There were ants everywhere. I hate ants. I hate small ants and I hate big ants. And I thought to myself, my wife, we were not in a very thankful mood at that time. In fact, I would say we were pretty much complaining. We need to get out of this place. What are we going to do? I called my mom. Mom, what do we do? What do we do with these ants? And she gave me a great recommendation. She said, you're not going to get rid of those ants, but I'll give you a temporary fix. Get your vacuum cleaner out and go to it. And so I got my vacuum cleaner out, and boy, I was just having a time, just vacuuming up all those ants. But you know what I found out? You couldn't vacuum them all out. There were too many of them. You'd get some out, and the next day they'd all come out. And I find, found myself, I'll, I'll be honest, I was complaining about God's creatures called carpenter ants. Anybody ever seen carpenter ants? Do you like them? Go ahead, raise your hand if you like them. Something wrong with you guys. <laughs> I 
Now the Bible says in everything, give thanks. You know what I should have done? Thank you, Lord, for these ants. Thank you for sending them our way. But Lord, I'm not going to eat them. Thank you, Lord, for sending them and just give me a lesson about your creation. Thank you that there's more here than I ever thought were in the whole world. Thank you, Lord, for being good to me and sending them to us as a special gift where other people don't have to be bothered by the ants. Thank you, Lord. I should have had that kind of attitude. But something didn't allow me to be thankful. I was a complainer. Would you have been complaining? Be honest. You had to be there to enjoy it. And as I was doing this, I was thinking about my job. You see what I did for a living, part of it. I had a number of jobs. I delivered Lazy Boy furniture. And you know who buys Lazy Boy furniture? Well-off people buy, well, Lazy Boy furniture. We'd go to these houses that must have been, back then, two, three hundred thousand dollar houses. We'd walk in there and they'd write a check for 10000 I think, where in the world are they getting all this money? I was just a poor college student. And I thought, here they are. They've got everything in life right here. No ants. And I've got all the ants. I'm struggling as a college student. It just doesn't make... And if I allowed myself, can I say I could be very bitter? But God's a good God. Thankful people do not complain. A Sunday school teacher asked her class, what are you thankful for? They were just little kids. And a boy screamed out, I'm thankful for wearing glasses. And the teacher was inquisitive. So she asked the little boy, why is it that you like wearing glasses? And the little boy quipped, because it keeps the older boys from fighting with me, and it keeps the girls from kissing me. That's why I like glasses. Now, if you can get a little boy like that that is thankful for wearing glasses, we can learn something from the little kids, can't we? And then there's others. A little boy was given an orange by a man. He took it and he said nothing. The mother looked at the little boy and said, Son, what do you say? And the boy looked at the man and said, Peel it. That's the other extreme. You know how I learned to be thankful? Mom would always say, What do you say? Somebody gives something to me, What do you say? Thank you. I, I, I couldn't even get it unless I said thank you. I had to say please, and I had to say thank you. I don't know how many times mom said, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? And it was ground into me to say thank you and please. And sadly, kids these days, I don't want to say they're all like this, but too many are unthankful for what they're given. Too many are unthankful for the goodness of God in their life. So I say, first of all, that thankful people do not complain. Number two, thankful people share. Thankful people share. The woman at the well, she was led to Christ by Jesus himself. And she went and told everyone what Jesus had done. You see, thankful people can't help but share. Man, God's been good to me. I can't help it. I, I like to tell people about Jesus. I like to give out a track and say, here, here's some good reading material. On the back, it tells you how to get to heaven. Thankful people share. Let me ask you a question tonight. Are you thankful for your salvation? Honestly, are you thankful that you're saved? Has it hit you that you're going to heaven? Has it hit you that there's more people going to hell than there are to heaven? Has it hit you that narrow is the way up there and wide is the gate that leads to destruction? Has it hit you that you are blessed of God and you're going somewhere where few people will be one day? God is so good to us. 
And if we're thankful for that, how can we not share the good news? It is good news, isn't it? We sing Jesus saves. Jesus saves. That's what we sing. But I wonder if we're thankful that he does in our lives. Ten lepers, you'll remember the story. Only one give thanks and nine of them went away unthankful. Thankful people share. Then thirdly, very quickly, thankful people are contented people. Let's use our Bibles a little. We got a little bit of time. Look over in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter number 4. Notice what Paul says. He says, verse number 11, if you'll look there, please. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state, and that includes New Hampshire, whatsoever state I am, therewith to be what? Content. Content. Hey, you can be happy. You don't have to move to Florida. We've got too many people moving to Florida. Amen? Let me say that again. We have too many people moving to Florida. New Hampshire is a great state. And all that happened, Paul, he said, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I have learned that I can be content with what I have. Paul said that. He didn't have the life that you and I have, but he was content. Oh, listen, you and I have... In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. God's got a great place for us one day. A mansion. I'd rather have a mansion up there than a mansion down here because the mansion up there is made by God. Amen. Mansion down here is made by man. It's tempted to just crumble one day. Won't last forever, but that mansion? Oh, that mansion? Let me tell you something. It's going to last forever and all eternity. I'd rather have that mansion than the mansion down here. Some of these preachers have mansions, million dollar mansions on the four corners of the, of the continent. They say God's been good. You don't want to know what I think about that. Let me tell you something, preacher. You don't need four houses. Amen. Amen. I know four houses may cause you to smile a little bit, but you don't need four houses. One house is good. A one-bedroom apartment is good. A house over there. There is good. We were over there painting, Brother Drew and his wife, my wife and I. And they're just youngsters. You know, they sit there and don't break a sweat. Easy to be 25 and not sweat at all. Here my wife and I, we look like a tornado came and blew us away. We're ragged, sweat pouring down. That's okay, they'll be, that, they'll be our age one day. When they are, I'll be looking down in heaven. I'll say, Lord, give me a front row seat on this. I want to see this. But we were over painting, getting the house ready. It'll be ready one day. We'll be in there. And I guarantee you, my wife and I will be thankful. Be thankful. Just be thankful. You may not have what somebody else... You, you know the easiest way to be unhappy is to look at what the others have and compare yourself with what they have. You want to set yourself up for an unhappy life? Go ahead. My, my sister made $10 million. She had a $1.5 million house, swimming pool, I think eight bedrooms, 10 baths. I mean, you walk here and you're lost. I needed a tour to know where I was going in the house. 
I mean, she had everything. Tennis court in the back. But I didn't need that to make me happy. I didn't need that. She just had a bigger house. She had a swimming pool, okay? She had a tennis court. I never saw him play on the tennis court. What good is a tennis court if you don't even play on it? Listen, no disrespect to my family. We'd go over Christmas and they had opened their presents some of them, we'd go into a big room. I'd, I'd say the, the room was as, I'd say it's from, from the back there, probably to the front row there. I mean, a huge room. We'd go in there and look over to the left. There'd be presents that they hadn't even gotten to yet. Did you hear what I said? They had so many presents, it was unbelievable. And many of them, they never even opened. I found out a long time ago that my kids got more enjoyment out of a box than they did a Christmas present. Played more with a box if the thing came in than the present itself. Why don't I just get the box? First Timothy 6, 8, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. As long as you have food, you have clothing, Praise God, you should be happy with that. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Praise God, hey, he'll never leave us. That's something to be thankful for. He's always there. In the parable of the vineyard, they were all complaining. Some of them were complaining that they had worked all day and the people that came in on the last hour, they got paid the same amount as the people that worked all day. And the reason they were complaining is because they were envious. People get envious. They get envious of others. People get dissatisfied with life because they think somebody else has more than them. Elvis Presley had it all. I've been to Graceland. I've seen his house. I've also seen the place where he's buried, by the way. And he died at 42 years of age. Did you get that? 42 years of age, he had it all. But he was never happy. He was never satisfied. And sadly, he died in his bathroom, in a praying condition, praying manner, over his toilet. They found him praying like this over his toilet. I believe Elvis Presley's in heaven today. I believe he accepted Christ as his Savior. He's just an instance of somebody that didn't use his life for the glory of God. Can you imagine Elvis Presley, his voice coming here and singing? Great, great evangelistic crusades. Elvis Presley singing Amazing Grace. Could you imagine how God could have used his life? Too many of us just fall into traps. We become unthankful because we just look around us and we compare our lives with other people have. If you're saved today, you're better off than most people in this world. You may not know where you're going to lay your head tonight, but I guarantee you, you're better off than most people in this world. Hey, unthankfulness breeds other sins. We have an epidemic of unthankfulness going on in our country and in the world. People are just unthankful. Question for you tonight. Do you need to start being more thankful to your God? Hmm. Has God spoken to your heart? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, please? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, these folks were unthankful. And it proved to be just cataclysmic to imagine them worshiping the creature more than the creator, to become prideful, to be engaging in sexual sins that we can't even talk about. 
Dear God, help us as your creation and people who are saved by the blood. Dear God, would you help us to become more thankful? Smite us when we complain. Help us when we're prone to just be a people that complains, murmur. Would you help us tonight? Would you speak to our heart? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me make sure you're saved tonight. Let me make sure you're saved. If you're saved, could you raise up your hand tonight? You know it. You're going to heaven. God bless you. Put your hand down. Now, maybe you're here tonight. You don't, you're not saved. Maybe you don't even know what that means. You're not sure where you're going to go. A great God has created you, created you to be with him for all eternity. But in order for that to happen, you must be saved. I wonder if there's somebody here tonight who say, Preacher, I'm not saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Pray for me. If that's you, anybody like that, just slip up your hand. I'll pray for you. Anybody like that? All right, I wonder who's here tonight. And you'd say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart. I don't mean to, but at times I can be somebody that complains. I'm not as thankful as I should be. God's been good to me. I wonder who's here tonight and God's spoken to your heart in some way. You'd say, preacher, I sit here tonight, God, the Holy Spirit, speaking to me about something. Pray for me. If that's you, could you slip up your hand? Just slip it up. Anybody like that? God bless you. Let's all stand, shall we? Everybody standing. Just a moment, the music's going to play. It won't be long tonight, but if you're going to come, why don't you come? I'm not saying you have an epidemic going on, but maybe in some way God's just spoken to your heart. Just think about how good God's been to you. Have you been reciprocal and giving Him thanks and praising Him? Have you praised Him this week? In your quiet time, do you open up your prayer time and say, Lord, thank you? Oh, He wants to hear it. Christian, he wants to hear it. If you're not going to do it, who is? Father, would you bless the invitation? May you speak to hearts, please. And may you receive glory for what's accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen.